With the attention of the world still concentrated on the Middle East and the escalation of the war in Syria and Iraq once again, it is easy to forget that another crisis is still carrying on, bubbling away in Europe. This is in the Ukraine. The Ukraine, of all the post-Soviet republics that came into being, was in some ways the most contentious. Whether it could be described as competing oligarchies or competing authoritarianism, struggling to maintain power, to make money, uh, we will discuss in a minute. But what is beyond dispute is that the decision by the European Union and NATO and of course the United States in particular to bring the Ukraine closer to the NATO camp was one of the factors in provoking a huge crisis which led to a forward move by Putin and the Russians who first annexed the Crimea uh, for geopolitical reasons, as they claimed. Uh, and then in the eastern Ukraine, there is very little doubt that Russian troops were involved uh, directly in supporting the separatist cause. Meanwhile, in the western part of the Ukraine, uh, historically much more anti-Russian than the east, uh, you had a toppling of a government which, for good or for bad, was elected. You had its removal. You had the Victoria Newland at the US State Department discussing the composition of the new government with the Germans and other Europeans. And you had the emergence of an unpleasant ultra-right nationalist current. This doesn't mean that the issue can be described simply as a struggle between uh, the Russians and fascism backed by NATO. It's more complex than that. And to discuss some of these complexities, we have with us in the studio Vladimir Ishenko, a Ukrainian scholar, a sociologist, editor of the magazine The Commons, and one of the members of the Political Council of Social Movement, a new radical progressive organization in the Ukraine. Vladimir, welcome. Thank you very much. Um, just before we come to the present, take us through the Ukraine, uh, Ukrainian politics, as they emerged after they broke away from the Soviet Union. The Ukraine, uh, had its own peculiarities. What were its peculiarities and what explains their evolution? Um, actually, many peculiarities. Ukraine was one of the most developed uh, parts of the Soviet Union. Uh, you should understand that it was, in 1991, it was over 50 million, and it was actually uh, probably a third of the population in the Soviet Union. It had an advanced industry, computer industry, space industry, uh, probably less advanced than in, in the West at that moment, but still it was definitely not the kind of like third world, uh, completely underdeveloped country. The country was developing. And uh, one of the problems then with the destruction of the Soviet Union that actually develop, this high development status of Ukraine was very much uh, dependent on other parts of the Soviet Union. And when it was distracted, the, uh, this kind of like advanced economy collapsed as well. The oligarchs came in who, that exploited uh, the old Soviet industries, mainly in uh, metallurgy, in coal mining, and uh, they made profits, but they didn't actually make investments to modernize that industry. And Let oh, me just stop yeah. you there. So the process that took place in the Ukraine uh, <clears throat> with the emergence of the oligarchs, privatizations, oligarchs being able to buy state property at mm. very cheap prices, 
this was virtually the same as in the former Soviet Union itself, as in Russia? Uh, not really. Russia, Russia ha has oil, Russia has gas, and it's a quite different structure of economy. Based on these profits, uh, super profits actually, they were able to um, actually supply the higher uh, living standards in Russia. Yeah. In Ukraine the situation was, was different. Uh, we didn't have so much natural resources and uh, the living standards were as well less than. And uh, the decreased living standards compared to the Soviet Union were actually exacerbating the internal problems in Ukraine. National problems, the language problems. It is basically a bilingual state. And uh, it was mainly the politicians and competing political parties, popular in the West and in the East, that were made uh, political capital on this language profits, language problems, uh, uh, exacerbating them, aggravating them, and helping to rise this competing Ukrainian and Russian nationalism on each side. So, yeah, uh, and another peculiarity was actually that for more than 20 years, since 1991, Ukraine didn't see uh, any serious uh, armed conflict. N nothing like in Moldova or in Georgia or in Central Asian countries happened. And Ukraine was perceived as a very peaceful place where people can coexist with each other. Yes, there are some differences, some problems, but nevertheless, we didn't collapse into some failed state. We didn't have the separatism before it started in 2014. And in 2014, it erupted. And of course, the, there were different uh, causes of that. And uh, one of them was the collapse of that kind of capitalism which emerged in Ukraine. Uh, uh, the oligarchs-driven peripheral capitalists, the people who were just um, like, repetitiously exploiting what were the remnants of the Soviet economy and Soviet industry, but without modernizing Ukrainian society, using uh, all these corruption links, uh, state preferences, and not being actually able to uh, build a more efficient kind of capitalism. That was one of the problems. Another problem was actually international, this competition between the Western EU and American imperialist blocs, because they have also quite different interests, and Russia on the other side. And it's now important to understand that imperialism is not just about American imperialism. Imperialism, as it was the classical theory in the left, it was about competing imperialist blocs. One may be stronger, one may be even much stronger, but it doesn't mean that the other is better because it's just weaker, like for example Russia. Russia during the First World War was also probably the weakest imperialist power in Europe, but still it was the reactionary state, uh, very authoritarian, and no one in the socialist movement was actually, almost no one, was thinking to support them. Because they were just the weakest. This was Tsarist Russia. Yeah, yeah. the yeah. Tsarist tar, tar, Russia. But surely the difference was this between there were competing uh, 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 imperialisms at the time of the First World War, but the Ukraine was part of Russia for a long, long time. Is that not the, not the case? Some parts of Ukraine became part of Russia even in the 17th century and then gradually Russia was taking more and more parts. And, and the Soviet Union in fact then added to Ukrainian yeah. territory. I think yes. it was under Khrushchev by making it a larger republic. Actually uh, during, in the start of the Second World War, Stalin uh, uh, annexed part of Eastern Poland where mostly Ukrainians and Belarusians lived. And in 1939, Ukraine became more or less uh, resembling what it looks now. People may speak in different languages, people may believe or in different gods or, in, or make different rituals and so on. But essentially, they uh, have the same uh, class interests. Workers in the Western Ukraine, in the Eastern Ukraine. And uh, part of the problem with the Maidan movement with the European Association was that uh, they, to some extent, they exacerbated these differences between Western and Eastern part. So this, the, all, the whole discussion about Ukraine is very much focused on the cultural problems, identity problems, but uh, forgets about the basic economy. And uh, of course, for 
like jobless people in Western Ukrainian villages. And this is very much a rural region, the less industrialized in Ukraine, where actually no job, no money. And uh, millions of people are migrating to EU, illegally migrating also, uh, to have some job. And of course, uh, they were very much uh, sympathetic to the agenda of uh, being close to Europe because they connected this with, first of all, with a free regime, that they will be allowed to come to Europe without bureaucratic problems and have worked there. And of course, many people uh, believe in Ukraine that finally Ukraine will become part of the European Union and join these richer nations and become richer itself. Uh, but on the other side, uh, there are Eastern Ukrainian workers that were mainly uh, able to work in the remnants of the Soviet industries, which worked mostly for Russian market. And for them, the uh, free trade zone with Europe, uh, the, the making worse relations with Russia and disrupting this economy links with Russia, the, this was a question of their jobs. This is not a class conflict between Western Ukrainian workers and Eastern Ukrainian workers. Let's now come to the most recent situation. The Maidan movement in 2014 that toppled the existing regime. And did that, was that largely responsible for the crisis that followed in terms of geopolitical uh, uh, ideas? Uh, Partially. Of course, you cannot say that it was not, it, it was not the only factor. No. That's obvious. And uh, uh, if reaction of Yanukovych, Ukrainian president, and of Russia would be different, the um, consequences would not be disastrous. So it's uh, different factors that uh, combined that produce the current situation. You cannot say that just because of Maidan movement, we have a civil war, we have a collapse in economy and so on. That would be a kind of like propaganda cliche. What is your opinion on the fact that the West, as we know now, it's not a big secret, was quite involved in drawing the Ukraine closer to NATO, which was a huge provocation and completely unnecessary, uh, in my opinion, and actually discussing the composition of the government. The yeah. No, it's it's more complicated because it was more the um, aspirations of Ukrainian elite and part of Ukrainian population to become part of EU and become part of NATO than of the EU and NATO themselves. Let's see what Ukraine is now. The country very close to Europe is quite good infrastructure and with the lowest wages in Europe. Of course, it has a war. It has oligarchs. It has bad legislation, bad governance non-transparent rules, but if you solve, if you freeze the conflict, at least freeze in the eastern Ukraine, if you uh, impose transparent rule of doing business on Ukrainian oligarchs, this is a perfect land of investing opportunities. Come here, invest and make profits on the super exploited labor, quite educated at the same time, and uh, not so many transportation problems and, in, for example, moving industry to China or to Africa, very close to European corporations. So European business can benefit on this. But I mean, you know, this is ignoring the fact that Europe itself is in a deep crisis. Exactly. To what extent does Ukrainian nationalism, which was far right and fascist, mm -hmm. <clears throat> play a part in this? We hear and read a lot about Bandera, and that mm -hmm. tradition, yeah. and uh, the Western media tries to cover this up, the other side possibly exaggerates it. What is your opinion? Uh, the other side obviously exaggerated, so you can say that Maidan was the fascist movement. No. no. But they were there have... fascist elements within it? Yes, exactly. There were fascist elements there, and we see that during Maidan, the far right, the Svoboda party, the main far right, far right party before Maidan, the right sector, the coalition previous, of previously marginal uh, far-right and even neo-Nazi groups, they were the most visible part of that movement. They participated, according to media reports, in the uh, in relative majority of the Maidan protests. So, what a, and not only in 
in all protests, but also in violent and confrontational protests. So they actually made a significant impact on that movement. Uh, also on the, its public image, which was unacceptable for many people in southeastern region, and which became a ground that was then exaggerated by hostile Russian media. They didn't invent Ukrainian fascists from, from scratch. They really exist. They really play, played an important role. And it was really kind of downplayed or denied by many Maidan supporters on the liberal side. And they also have play, they take, take some responsibility for that, for what that happened. The real problems that were exacerbated by competing imperialist nationalist politicians. What is the situation now? Like in very general terms, uh, these are essentially two client states, I would say. Obviously, the so-called People's Republics in Donbass and Lugansk. In Donetsk. Um, in Donetsk and yeah. uh, Lug uh, Lugansk, the region is called Donbass. Uh, they are very much tightly controlled by Russia, and you cannot say this, uh, this is independent states. It's obviously puppet states, where uh, like the main decisions are decided in Kremlin. It's just you shouldn't have any illusions about the yeah. independence or any like people's progressive character. They have some strong words against Ukrainian oligarchs, and they made some very uh, little moves in nationalization again of previous olig Ukrainian oligarchs owned shops or some mines, but uh, they do not have any uh, kind of consistent progressive politics and they don't have resources for this. You should understand this uh, sm very small territories where probably three million people live now, and most of them, they, these are older people, because younger people emigrated from there. It's a very obvious uh, thing to emigrate from the war to Ukraine or to Russia. And so the older people are more dependent on the state supplies and on the pensions. So no, not so much resources for development, not so much actual uh, opportunities to create any progressive thing there. And the bigger part of Ukraine... Uh, this is also, you said, a client state. Yes, I would say this is a client state, uh, very much dependent on the Western financial support without which it would... Uh, they would collapse. The, the economy would collapse. And, uh, so uh, de 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 dependent on the... actual that kind of reforms that are imposed by the International Monetary Foundation Fund. And uh, actually the crucial decisions within the government are also discussed, first of all, with the United States, so in, I mean, the, the, what you're describing is really a tragedy. In a, effectively, you know, leaving aside the proportions, the Ukraine is split. Uh, you have the United States backing one side and the Russians uh, backing the other side. And the political forces in each part of the Ukraine more or less going along with this. But what about civil society now? I mean, let's discuss <clears throat> these parties in, in the Ukraine are effectively parties tied to one or other branches uh, of the oligarchy with different uh, rhetoric. What has happened to the cultural and intellectual traditions in the Ukraine, which were more internationalist, which... Uh, argued against this type of government which proposed something progressive. I mean, you are a member of the social movement, but this is a very small organization. And how do you function then? Uh, the problem is that we actually didn't have so much of uh, progressive tradition in post-Soviet Ukraine. And um, one of the problems with Maidan was uh, that, uh, and why it went in this uh, tra tragic direction uh, was the uh, degradation of the Ukrainian left, degradation of the Ukrainian Communist Party, which was part of the, all the Communist Party of the Soviet Union, Communist Party of Ukraine. 
and which for the 20 years uh, was becoming more and more conservative. First it was a social conservative agenda. They were mostly saying that we have to go back to the Soviet Union, although it was quite kind of like obviously impossible, and uh, defending the remnants of the Soviet welfare state, which was not a bad idea. Yeah. But still the problem is that they didn't have the proactive progressive project. The idea was we have to go back, not an idea where can we go forward. And uh, then it was combined with cultural conservatism. Uh, the party was uh, homophobic and uh, becoming more and more even clerical. Clerical communists, for example, siding with with one with one part of the church cleavage in Ukraine, saying that Ukrainian Church of Moscow Patriarchate was more canonical than Ukrainian Church of Kiev Patriarchate. Also, it was clear conflict between church elites where the communists just <laughs> don't have to involve at all, but uh, it was important for their Russian friendly agenda. And all, 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 they always were very much for the union with Russia, despite the Russia itself was not a progressive state anymore. And uh, in the end, they ended as politically conservative party when they uh, ended supporting Yanukovych government, even when it went into quite obvious repression against the movement. The most uh, shameful fact was that on January 16, uh, all MPs from the Communist Party voted for the repressive laws. The Yanukovych government was pushing through the this parliament. This is uh, in 2014? Uh, no, 16. January 16, they, they were called in Ukraine dictatorship laws. Ah, right. Okay. Ten laws uh, with breaking of parliamentary procedure pushed through the parliament, uh, limiting the civic liberties, which then, a few days later, they provoked the mass violence in Kiev. All communist MPs voted for them. Not even all the party of regions, pro Yanukovych party, voted for those laws. And that was a sign. The party became, uh, the leadership of the party became a kind, kind of like normal part of the bourgeois elite, selling the places in the electoral list to oligarchs, to rich people. The richest woman in the parliament, Oksana Kaletnik, was part of the communist parliamentary group, which was again embarrassing. And uh, this is a basis for explanation why Maidan went to the right. right. There was no... no the left just degenerated. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And the new left, which could be possibly, uh, potentially, the part of the left wing of Maidan, they were extremely weak. They participate in some places, showing some movies, uh, making some discussions, not, in, not just in Kiev, in Lviv, in Kharkiv, in Western, in the East of Ukraine, but uh, the impact of that activities were zero. Just they, almost, they couldn't change anything. Mm -hmm. They were much weaker than the right in the Maidan. So that's uh, why it's happened. And now we have to make sure that main task to try to build the new left movement in Ukraine, also on the political level, that's, uh, it's, uh, in, that in future crucial moments that we will have the organization, the uh, tools to make uh, some at least visible and significant impact on what is happening in the country, not what, not what happened during Maidan, but uh, it should try to influence the politics. And that's the idea behind the social movement. Uh, that's, uh, social I, 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 idea to create a broad left party, and unfortunately this is the only kind of left party that can exist yes. in Ukraine, <coughs> bringing people from different left traditions and, and trying to combine resources and to bring the Ukrainian left to at least more significant and more visible level. And also it's important that uh, we don't want to split on the questions like support for Maidan or support for anti-Maidan, pro-Ukrainian, pro-Russian. Different people are there. And we can try to unite uh, around the class interests. 
as I said, the workers in, in the Western Ukraine, workers in the Eastern Ukraine, despite all their cultural differences, despite all the different political attitudes, they have uh, very much in common. The basic economy interests uh, they have, they, they are the same. They need jobs, they need good wages, uh, they need uh, health care, good education. education and this public things, housing. Yeah, exactly. And the left may propose how to find resources for the things, progressive taxation, nationalization, uh, fighting of capital flight to offshores, uh, default on the foreign debt, which is now um, probably all, uh, as high as uh, Ukrainian GDP, and very soon we will have another Greece, not within EU, but close to EU, unable to pay it foreign debt. Ukraine is a rich country, and it can use these resources for, for the people. And that's uh, the basic ideas we have now. And how much support do you have? Uh, actually, we have the task to register the party because we, we need kind of like 10,000 signatures to, to register, to register party. the party. And this have to come from two thirds of Ukrainian regions. So actually, kind of like big territory have to be covered. And that's what we work now. And uh, we have support from some independent trade unions. Uh, and that actually brings hope that it will be a serious project. Uh, because they feel that they also need some political representation for the labor. Yes. And they are not represented by other parties. Um, one of the questions which, is, uh, which we try to mobilize around is a new labor code which may be uh, supported by the parliament. They actually voted for uh, this code in the first reading and uh, it have to replace the old Soviet code with uh, less trade union friendly, more employer friendly uh, relations. Uh, so we try to mobilize around it and obviously trade unions are against it. One of the tricks uh, to vote for the new labor code was, uh, was actually the um, requirement from EU to implement non-discrimination clause because the, the Soviet legislation was not really sensitive to LGBT discrimination and uh, it mm. has to be said that there cannot be any discrimination based on gender, race uh, and so on. <coughs> and uh, this was a requirement for visa-free regime so that was one of the ideological legitimation for, for that. But these things are very important, but clearly the central thing is to have an economic platform yeah. which represents the interests of working people and the poor. And this is a problem not just in the Ukraine, though it's exaggerated mm -hmm. there, but it's a problem all over Europe, new Europe, mm -hmm. old Europe. And where it doesn't happen, then you have extreme right-wing parties going up and up and up, as we see in many parts of Europe today. Unfortunately, it's uh, the same in Ukraine, where uh, probably the nationalist opposition, far-right opposition, will emerge much quicker than the left opposition. And the uh, social grievances will be more probably exploited by the populist far-right that will criticize the government both on the nationalist platform as the traitors who negotiate with Russia, who are ready to accept some concessions, give some concessions to the separatists. And also on the social basis, the pointing to obvious economic problems, to declining living standards, low wages and the things. They will be able to mobilize around it and some oligarchs will be ready to support them. Just very recently, Notorious Igor Kolomoisky, one of the richest pe people in Ukraine. Uh, he uh, declared that Far Right Svoboda Party and so called Ukro Party, sponsored by Kolomoisky, very obviously, they will have a coalition in the parliament. So he may give some support <coughs> for, for this kind of politics. Not mean very and there is a very long way to create a left. Uh, very, Ukraine. very illuminating what you've been saying and of course it's both like other countries in Europe 
but also unlike them. And we will continue this discussion some other time. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you very much. Thank you.